Hey everyone, Sean Kipe here. I'm excited for you to hear our latest series, In the Land of Lies. But before we begin, I want to share with you how this is going to go. Each week, we'll publish a new episode for free, available on all platforms. That's 10 episodes in total, available every Monday. But if you just can't wait for new episodes and want to get early access and an ad-free experience, you can subscribe to the Imperative channel right now on Apple Podcasts. It's your choice. With over 100 hours of content available on the Imperative channel, it's a great slate of shows already. And I've seen a list of the new series coming out by the end of this year, and there are so many amazing titles that I know you'll absolutely love. And uh, you'll get another series from me this fall. Stay tuned. Thanks for your support. And now, let's begin our show. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. My name is Sean Kipe, and I'm about to tell you an incredible, true story. A story that contains murder, drug trafficking, police corruption, and crime rings. But also, juiced-up bodybuilders, a Russian boxer, and a KGB CIA double agent. A story with so many twists and turns, lies and deceptions, and unbelievable yet proven true events, you'll kind of wish that it was made up. In the twilight hours of April 15th, 1993, in the Atlanta suburb of Sugar Hill, Georgia, 53-year-old Emma Jean Thompson had dinner with her son, Michael. Several hours later, at approximately 9.50 p.m., procrastinators rushing to file their taxes before the midnight deadline, this kind, unassuming, divorcee grandmother was departing the trailer she and her son lived in and heading to her night shift at Cibavision, manufacturing contact lenses. Thompson would never arrive to work. The murder of a Sugar Hill woman found shot at a Buford muffler this shop. This 53-year-old grandmother, whom friends say never harmed anyone, was found brutally murdered shot at close range, execution style, twice Someone in the fired head. two fatal bullets into Emma Jean Thompson as she sat in this car April 15th. At this time in the investigation, numerous witnesses have started coming forward saying the that the 38 caliber indeed. murder weapon has not been recovered. On the morning of April 16th, Emma Jean Bertha Thompson was found slumped over in the driver's seat of her brown 1986 Lincoln Continental parked outside of the Gwinco muffler shop not far from her home. She had been robbed and shot twice in the back of the head at point-blank range, killing her instantly. The front left tire was slashed and there were drops of blood on the ground on both sides of the car and in the passenger side door jam. Her shattered eyeglasses lay on the center console next to her curly, graying hair and a pool of blood. On the dashboard lay a single, yellow rose wrapped in cellophane. The investigation and subsequent arrest that would follow the murder of Emma Jean Thompson would receive media coverage throughout the country, and court TV would nationally televise the trial that would eventually conclude with the conviction and sentence of life in prison of a police officer. Dependable. This is Channel 5 Eyewitness News at 6. Baffled for a week by the murder of an elderly woman, Gwinnett police now say the killer was one of their own. Gwinnett County police have made an arrest in the murder of a Sugar Hill woman found shot at a Buford muffler shop. Investigators say a fellow Gwinnett County police officer is responsible for the murder and robbery of Emma Jean Thompson. 32-year-old Mike Chappell is now being held without bond in the Gwinnett County Jail. He was also involved in three internal affairs investigations, all in which his good name was cleared. A name no one really associated with murder until now. The evidence presented at trial showed that 32-year-old Gwinnett County Police Officer Michael Harold Chappell had robbed Emma Jean Thompson of nearly $7,000 in cash after firing two fatal rounds from a 38 caliber pistol 
into the back of her skull. The victim's blood was on the raincoat Chapel was wearing. The victim's blood was in Chapel's patrol car. Numerous eyewitnesses described seeing a police officer at the scene of the murder, located off a busy street. And one eyewitness positively ID'd that officer as Michael Chapel. But Chapel has vehemently maintained his innocence for 29 years, and a growing number of people have banded together to support him, tirelessly fighting for his release and exoneration as new information has emerged. But how can anyone looking at the mountain of evidence stacked against Chapel truly believe that he's anything other than guilty? I have looked at all of that evidence. 20,000 some odd pages of documentation and I have seen for myself that the case against Michael Chappell is manufactured. I never ever believed that he was even closely remotely capable of any such act. There was no way, no way. You realize that a lot of the information that you believed all those years is simply not true. I've done the homework, I've done the research, I've seen the evidence. I know that Michael Chappell is not guilty. I can absolutely prove that Michael Chappell did not kill Emma Jean Thompson. In this 10-episode podcast, you'll hear the case of Michael Chappell, a case that some say is the very definition of injustice in our legal system. That is, if it can be proved that an innocent man has spent the past 29 years locked away for a crime he did not commit. I'll not try to convince you of this man's innocence or of his guilt. I'll simply lay out the evidence presented to me that has been independently collected by numerous people throughout the past 29 years and let you make up your own mind. You must decide for yourself, innocent or guilty. I'll review photo and video evidence, hundreds of documents, trial transcripts, and key witness testimony, in addition to the interviews I'll conduct. And you'll hear from those who believe that they have the evidence that proves that this man is innocent of the crime he was convicted for and has spent the past 29 years thinking about. The question is, after hearing all of this, what will you believe? I'm Sean Kite. From Imperative Entertainment, this is In the Land of Lies. My name is Henry Ball. I come from the state of Louisiana. You can look around my office here and see that I'm a big LSU fan. I'm a father. I have a seven-year-old. I've been married for 25 years. I'm just an, just an ordinary guy, to be honest with you. Henry Ball is the 52-year-old vice president of a bustling home renovation company located in Stockbridge, Georgia, just southeast of Atlanta. We renovate predominantly apartment communities, multifamily. I first became aware of Henry when he emailed me sometime in the summer of 2021. He reached out repeatedly, one could say incessantly, not to sell me on new countertops or bathroom flooring, but instead urging me to look into the case of a man I'd never heard of, Michael Chappell. Claiming that he was falsely imprisoned for a murder, Henry could prove he did not commit. Michael Chappell did not kill Imogene Thompson. He's innocent of this crime. I'm going to try not to be any, you know, dispassionate either way. I'm going to just try to tell you, you know, that these are the facts. Henry has become the biggest advocate for Michael Chappell's innocence in the past few years even recently writing a book titled Michael Chapel, He's spent abundant amounts of his own time and money to investigate and lay out what he says is evidence that not only proves Chapel is innocent of killing Emma Jean Thompson, but that he was framed for the murder by none other than fellow officers at the Gwinnett County Police Department and former Gwinnett County District Attorney Danny Porter. My first thought after hearing this, it's a very very bold claim to make. Danny Porter, you know, he's not going to be a fan. He's not going to be a fan of this podcast. He's not a fan of my book, but he's got, he's got questions to answer that he can't answer legally and publicly. It's, it's way past time for him to be forced to answer them. 
I've looked into a lot of wrongful convictions now, and I've, I've kind of gotten educated on wrongful convictions. And, uh, and I really do believe this is the holy grail of wrongful convictions. Henry is an intelligent, successful man who, for whatever reason, feels Chapel is innocent. And I've come into this story wondering the same thing you might be now. Why are Henry Ball and others like him so adamant that Michael Chapel is innocent when everything presented at his trial points to a guilty man who deserves to be in prison for the rest of his life? Something intrigued me about Henry's persistence, his willingness to put everything he has, his time, his money, his reputation, on the line for a man he barely knows. Because the man that they put in jail for her murder is not the perpetrator. Someone else is, and they let them get away with it. Because at the end of the day, this woman lost her life, you know, over, you know, a few thousand bucks. It's, it's, it's horrible. And, you know, that doesn't change the tragedy that also befell the Chapel family. And so I want to be respectful to both of them. Henry isn't alone in his views. The Facebook group he recently started called Michael Chapel is Innocent already has hundreds of dedicated, vocal members. A housewife watching a TV special on Chapel's case started her own investigation. An alternate juror at his trial spent the rest of his life working to overturn what he claimed was a gross miscarriage of justice. And there were more through the years. Each person finding pieces of information and evidence that might lend credibility to Chapel's claims of innocence. That documentation now sits locked in a storage facility of Henry's for safekeeping. Police reports, witness statements, crime scene photographs and analysis, trial transcripts and testimonies, they all could provide the facts needed to prove Michael Chapel is innocent. And what if he is? So I told Henry, if he's so confident that Chapel is innocent and he says he can prove it, then do it. Prove it. So Michael Chapel entered my life uh, at some point when I was in my early uh, 20s, I think. I may have met him like when I was 14 or 15 years old when I came on a family trip to the Atlanta area. And I remember there being a couple of police officers there, but their family is littered with police officers. So I'm not 100% sure if I met Mike then or not, but it, you know, it, I was a 14 year old kid, so it, it didn't mean much. But once I had moved to the Atlanta area, his family and my sister's family got together quite often. Henry's older sister was friends with Chapel's wife, Erin, and he tells me what he remembers of Chapel when he moved to Atlanta in 1989. Of course, I'm much bigger in stature now than I was when I was 20, but I was 6'7 when I was 20. And I, you know, I worked out, I played football, I was a decent sized person. Henry is a big guy. Standing at six foot seven, he seems to tower over my six foot tall, fairly skinny frame. Those seven inches of height make up a surprisingly big difference. And what I remember about Michael Chapel is we were the same height, but he was demonstrably bigger than me. He was, he was imposing. Even as a person who was six seven and a pretty decent sized fella, this guy was an imposing figure because he was also six seven, but he was 300 pounds of solid muscle. So to me, I thought he was like, you know, plus he was a police officer, you know, so he's already an authority figure, but I was definitely taken by his appearance. He was, he was big. And Mike Chappell was a big dude, even to Henry. He was an avid weightlifter, an amateur bodybuilder. He loved the art of bodybuilding so much that he opened his own gym to train at and mentor others. All cops have side gigs, right? You know, they do security and stuff like that. And Mike did those kind of things. But he also had a little small gym. It, you know, it was kind of a hole in the wall. It was the bottom of this building he leased out and, uh, and had, you know, some equipment that he had bought in a fire sale. Um, but, you know, it was a good little gym. 
you know, we go in today and they're these big, you know, meccas of, you know, high technology. His was just, you know, good workout equipment and good knowledge. And, uh, and I think he really um, excelled at mentoring people and helping people work out. And, uh, and you know, he was kind of a personal trainer. A lot, a lot of other cops worked out there. Iron World Gym was Mike's home away from home, his sanctuary. A small, gritty gym that reminds me of Vince Vaughn's Average Joe's Gym in the movie Dodgeball. It was accessible to everyone, no matter what physical condition you were in. And there was a sense of community, unlike larger chains like Gold's Gym. Chapel pumped iron there nearly every day. His love of weightlifting and training and his unusually large size are important. Chapel was 6'7 and nearly 300 pounds of solid, lean muscle. For reference, that's just shy of the size of Hulk Hogan in his mid-80s prime, minus the bleached hair and spray tan. You know, again, I've described him, and you can only describe him so many times, but like at the time, one of his other side gigs is he did uh, security for the head coach, of the, uh, Jerry Glanville, the head coach of the Atlanta Falcons. Jerry Glanville invited him to try out for the Atlanta Falcons. You know, this guy was huge. He was, a, you know, he was an NFL linebacker, you know. I mean, he wasn't, but he could have been. Um, but he, he chose to be a cop because that's what he loved doing. He loved helping people. You know, the mentoring, mentoring people at the gym, mentoring guys into becoming, you know, better men and becoming cops themselves and going into the Marine Corps. I, I could give you countless people that say that Mike, you know, led them on that path. Chapel enlisted in the U.S. Marines at the age of 21. And after two years of active duty serving his country, went on to join the DeKalb County Sheriff's Office while still in the Marine Reserves. In the mid-80s, he joined the Gwinnett County Police Department, or GCPD. By 1993, Chapel and his wife had two young children. He was, by all accounts, a model police officer receiving 33 separate commendations for outstanding public service throughout his career. So how and why did this man, who seems to have done nothing but serve and mentor others his entire professional career, come to be a killer? The murder occurred in 93. I was, I turned 23 years old uh, in May of 93. I wasn't somebody that spent a lot of time trying to be associates with or friends with Michael Chapel and the people that I knew in his family. But I knew them. And uh, so when this happened, I, I heard his name on the news and, you know, I would pay attention. And this was like one of the biggest stories happening at the time. And this was one of the biggest local news stories of the time when it broke, that a uniformed police officer had killed an innocent woman after robbing her while on duty. If you ask people in the area today about this case or the trial, though they may have some of the facts wrong, they still remember that a cop was found guilty of cold-blooded murder. Like everybody else, I was shocked. You know, this woman was found dead in her car. She'd been shot twice in the head. They came to find out fairly quickly that Mike had been investigating, and they said secretly investigating a burglary that occurred at her house. So when all of this news hit the airwaves, it was shocking. And it led me ultimately to believe that, you know, perhaps Mike had done this. In order for us to really understand why Henry Ball and others claim that Michael Chappell was framed for the murder of Emma Jean Thompson, we need to understand what happened from the days leading up to and including the night the murder occurred all the way through the trial. Chapel enters this story just two weeks prior to Emma Jean Thompson being found shot to death in her vehicle in front of a local muffler shop. It all started with a 911 call from Thompson to Gwinnett County Police to report a burglary at her home. This is the only time you'll hear Emma Jean Thompson's voice in this series. Put that 911. Hold on. Yes. Is he police, ma'am? Yes. What's the problem? I have had some money taken from my home. What's your name? Emma Jean Thompson. Okay. Miss Thompson, we'll get someone over there. So on April 3rd, 1993, Emma Jean Thompson called the police. They actually held the call through shift change because the call came in prior on like the day shift. 
but it was about you know, 30 minutes before shift change. So they actually held the call and assigned it to Michael Chappell, who was the first call that he handled that day. He was there around 2.30, you know, 2.45 in the afternoon at Imogene Thompson's home. Imogene had called Gwinnett County Police to report that some $7,000 in cash was stolen from a secret stash she had hidden behind a large credenza in her living room. Chapel arrived at the trailer park in the neighborhood of Sugar Hill, where she resided. Michael Thompson, her son, was actually there when Michael Chapel showed up, and she showed Michael Chapel a cut screen on her back door. She said, well, I think somebody came in here, you know, said I had an envelope that had $14,000 taped to the back of a dresser that was sitting in her living room. You had to pull the drawer out and it was kind of taped to the back of the dresser. So, you know, nobody who didn't know where it was wouldn't have just immediately found it. You know, Michael Chapel thought that it was very odd that A, only half of the money was stolen and B, the rest of the house hadn't been overturned as it would have been in a burglary where somebody found a hidden stash of money. So he told her that he believed that somebody in the house, which was only her and Michael Thompson, was the perpetrator. And he began to question Michael Thompson in front of her. Chapel's attention immediately turned to Imogene's son, Michael Thompson. He'd been in trouble with the law before and was known to have been associated with a small group that were involved in drug dealing and robberies, which Henry dubbed the Sugar Hill Gang. At that time, he was 25 years old. He, he just just kind of seemed like a ne'er-do-well. He had been in, you know, in and out of jail. He had a daughter that uh, he was behind like four or $5,000 in child support. I believe he had already been to jail for that. But he had also recently been put on notice just prior to the initial burglary at his mother's house that he was in danger of going to jail again for non-payment of child support. He was implicated by one of his close associates in, you know, potentially other burglaries, safe cracking. He was a known drug addict. He was known to Gwinnett County Police Department as a, a druggie. So, you know, I didn't see a whole lot that led me to believe that this guy was an upstanding citizen. Chapel started questioning him about the missing money. The most glaring fact being that there was $14,000 in cash that Imogene had received from an insurance policy, and only half of it was taken, as if the supposed intruder didn't want to totally screw the victim over. Without any, you know, damage occurring anywhere, they didn't tear the place up. They just went right to the stash and stole half of the cash. Whoever did it would have actually had to put the stash back and re, you know, like put it back in its hiding place, which was taped to the back. So they took the envelope down, brought it out, took half the money, put the envelope back and retaped it to the spot before, you know, before leaving. No burglar in the history of mankind has only taken half of a stash and then put it back unless that was a family member or somebody within the household. So Michael Chappell was convinced right away that Michael Thompson was the perpetrator and he said that and Imogene Thompson refused to press charges against her son. Imogene admitted to Chapel that she knew her son had stolen money from the same stash previously, but it was only a couple hundred dollars then. He wouldn't lie to her about this. There was nothing more for Chapel to do, since Imogene refused to press charges against her son, so he called it into the station on his radio that no report was requested, and after giving Imogene his business card, he left. Now, Mike had given her a card, which had the number to his gym, which he told her that he would be at his gym up until about two o'clock every day. So if she needed to reach him during the day, and he gave this to everybody, not, not just her. And then on the front side, it had the precinct number, which he told her that he went on shift at, you know, 2.30 um, to 10.30. At the request of Sergeant D.E. Stone, Chapel began to fill out a report on the incident, but would receive another call before finishing. No big deal. He'd get to it later. 
This wasn't necessarily out of the ordinary for a non-emergency call. He placed the unfinished report in his briefcase. So it, it wasn't the end of it. In fact, the next day, April 4th, someone claiming to be Imogene Thompson, so we assume Imogene Thompson, calls the precinct, not, not 911 or dispatch, but called the precinct speaks to the day sergeant and requests that Michael Chapel come back to her house or to, to call her back. So he called her house, no one answered. So he went by her house as he started his patrol that day. That was April 4th. Once Chapel arrived at Imogene's home, she approached him with an unusual request regarding her son, Michael. Chapel had previously helped a friend of Imogene's who had been in a similar situation. That woman's daughter had stolen some of her jewelry and pawned it for drug money. Chapel scared the girl by saying he had found some of the jewelry and it was being tested for fingerprints at the crime lab, which scared the young girl enough to come clean with her mother. Instead of taking her daughter to jail, Mike helped get her daughter into rehab. And so she wanted Mike to help her in the same way to recover her money with her son and she didn't want her son to go to jail. And he basically said, the only thing I could do is try to scare your son. I can show up at his work, you know, tell him that I've found some bills that's got his fingerprints on it. And once it comes back from the crime lab, I'm gonna arrest him and his friends if he doesn't fess up and, you know, help recover your money. It's called running the boo. Imogene Thompson thought it was a brilliant plan, asked Mike to engage in that plan, and he left. Running the boo was a tactic used to scare someone into confessing or cooperating by making them think that police had more information or evidence on a suspect than they actually did. Two days later, he showed up at Michael Thompson's work at the subway and said, you know, I found found a couple of bills and a wrapper, got your, you know, I'm sure it's got your fingerprints on it. It's, you know, been sent to the crime lab. When it comes back and, you know, positive for your fingerprints, you and all your little friends are going to jail unless you help me recover your mom's money. Michael Thompson maintained his innocence and there wasn't really anything Michael Chappell could do. And that was the last contact from what GCPD was able to find and from what anybody is able to to show occurred, that was the last contact he had with either one of them. And that would have been on April 7th, eight days prior to the murder. Chapel was skeptical. Mike knew he was guilty, but he just, you know, he didn't really have anything to prove it. Just over a week after this encounter, Imogene Thompson would be dead at the Gwenco muffler shop, little more than a mile from her home. The trial would show that Chapel, in an effort to steal the remaining $7,000 of Imogene's cash, was stalking her, learning her movements, and had arranged a meeting with her on the night of April 15th under the guise of comparing serial numbers with $100 bills he had found with those of the remaining money she had. He allegedly, you know, told her to bring her cash and meet him that night. One of her friends said that she talked to Imogene six or eight times a day, including the day of the murder, and they expected her to um, have this clandestine meeting with with Mike Chappell. They then claimed that uh, Chappell's whereabouts were unknown up until he got a dispatch call around the time of the murder, and, and then he went back on duty, if you will. Why would Chappell request to meet Imogene in the parking lot of a muffler shop? at nearly 10 p.m. to compare serial numbers on the cash instead of, say, at the police station. Well, the only reason could be for the robbery. That's why it was such damaging information. You know, I recall when I heard it the first time, it was very shocking, and that it was coming from, you know, the police department and the district attorney, and these they had these witnesses. And so it led me to, you know, really question Mike and, wow, you know, is he really capable of having done this?
witnesses saw a police officer who they allege is Michael Chapel at Gwenco Muffler Shop as early as 8.45 on the night of the murder. And they believe the murder occurred between 9.45 and 10 o'clock, so at least an hour before the murder. Michael was laying in wait. The police car was seen behind the victim's car right at, you know, 10 o'clock. Witnesses saw an officer walking up to the victim's car with a flashlight in his hand. And then those same witnesses say that as they passed the crime scene, the officer went back, got in his car and followed them, caught up to them, rode alongside them so that one of them was able to identify Michael Chapel, And then he turned and, and went in the opposite direction. Nearby residents reported hearing two distinctive gunshots ring out around 10 p.m. that night. The hulking chapel, wearing a bright yellow, police-issued size 3X rain jacket and cap, was easily visible through the pouring rain. It apparently happened fast. There was a cigarette in her ashtray burned all the way down, looked like it had been lit, possibly one drag taken off of it, set in the ashtray and burned all the way down because Imogene was shot in the back of the head. The purse that was believed to be with her in the vehicle was gone, so they believe that Mike reached in, shot her in the head, grabbed her bloody purse, threw it in his car, and sped off down Peachtree Industrial, caught up to the guys that had just passed Gwenco Muffler Shop, where one of them was able to, you know, positively identify him. And then he turned and went in the other direction. While all this was unfolding, Chapel was still on duty. He had, had received a dispatch call at 9.56 p.m., which sent him to Arden Road, which was kind of across town. It was a, like a domestic. There had been some kids that had gotten a fight earlier in the day, so it wasn't like an emergency call. You know, he talked to the lady, and she she reported that he was courteous and nice and uh, said that he would send somebody by to follow up the next day. And then uh, he, he went to the precinct for uh, end of watch at 10.30. Chapel went back to the precinct and logged out for the day at 10.30 p.m. There are records to prove that. Gwinnett County Police soon became aware that Chapel had contact with the victim shortly before the murder took place, and the wheels were set in motion. They begin to investigate Chapel and find out that not only did he have contact with the victim, but according to friends and neighbors of Emma Jean Thompson, he had supposedly stalked her. One neighbor even took a photograph of Chapel's car in Thompson's driveway as proof. Upon examining his financial records, investigators claimed he had recently fallen on hard times, providing motive. It had been eight days since Imogene's murder. Gwinnett County Police had questions. On April 23rd, toward the end of watch, Mike was contacted by Jack Burnett, and asked to meet them at headquarters for questioning in this case. He went in knowing what he was going in to be questioned about, but he did not know at that point that he was a suspect. He just was, you know, called in by Jack Burnett. Mike considered him a mentor uh, to some degree at that point. Lieutenant John Laddie and Sergeant Jack Burnett, the lead investigator on the case, began to question Chapel. The entire interrogation was videotaped. It was came across as a, a regular 42 burglary call. All right. I met with Ms. Uh, Thompson and her son, Mike. They walked Mike through the crime repeatedly. And, and you know, Mike acknowledged to them that it, did, it didn't look good for him. They talked about the things that were stacked against him. Now, she also told them that you told her, that you told her, and she told more than one person this, that in regard to the $100 bill and the van, that you were talking about the money van, that you told her that you needed to meet with her and compare serial numbers with the money that she had left. Okay, okay. I never told her that. None whatsoever. Okay. They were using the fact 
that he had worked with this woman. He didn't really file a report. They felt like it was a secret investigation. People had, you know, identified him, uh, and, uh, and the friends of the victim claimed that he was, you know, virtually stalking her, had followed her a couple of times, you know, was in this active investigation that he was keeping secret from the police department. Mike denied all of this. As soon as Chapel realized that it looked as if he would be arrested, his demeanor changed. Several times, he placed his head in his hands, wiped his eyes, and let out long, frustrated sighs as if he knew he was defeated. But you know, Mike, if you don't, if you don't tell us what happened, if you don't help us understand what happened, the, the events that led to this, everybody's going to draw their own conclusions. People are, yeah. I'm fried. I mean, I couldn't be more fucked than I am now. That's the most, that is overwhelming evidence. All I've got is what I know happened. And that's not going to do me any good. I don't want to say, I have no alibi. I have nothing. Ultimately, they ended the interrogation, and it was about a three-hour interrogation, and they ended it by arresting him. Michael Chappell was arrested for the murder of Emma Jean Thompson and turned in his service weapon, keys, and his badge. His patrol car was taken into custody so it could be searched and forensically processed. So they charged him with felony murder, malice murder, armed robbery, and an illegal gun possession charge. He set a $500,000 bond. Chapel would spend the next two and a half years in jail awaiting his trial, while District Attorney Danny Porter and Gwinnett County Police built their case against him. They interviewed dozens of eyewitnesses, obtained warrants, and searched Chapel's home and Iron World gym for evidence and for the murder weapon. They searched his lockers at the precinct and confiscated his raincoat, which would prove to be one of their key pieces of evidence at the trial, as they would allege that it contained high-velocity blood spatter from the victim. They would also later find a trace amount of Imogene Thompson's blood on the armrest of his patrol car. Chapel had been caught, and there was no way out. As hard as it was to fathom for most people at the time, it seemed to them that a police officer had, in fact, killed an innocent woman in cold blood for $7,000. So the main evidence presented against Mike at trial was his raincoat. The witnesses that said that they saw an officer identified that he was wearing his yellow rain slicker, rain hat. This raincoat was said to have a volume of high velocity blood spatter on it, which you would expect if if someone was shot at close range. They also had the armrest or a piece of the armrest from Mike's patrol car, which they had found a uh, 40 nanograms of the victim's blood. The witnesses, the uh, the friends who alleged that, you know, Mike had set up this clandestine meeting, Mike's lack of a police report. There was officers brought in to say that at some point they believed that Mike may have owned a gun that, you know, matched the description of the gun that they were looking for. You're looking at all this evidence. If I'm sitting here, this dude's fucking guilty. Uh, You know, uh, yeah, that story, that narrative, what was what was presented both to the public and at trial, it painted a pretty uh, a pretty bleak picture for Mike Chappell, absolutely. And the jury agreed. And the jury agreed. On September 8th, 1995, Michael Harold Chappell was found guilty for the murder of Emma Jean Thompson and now faced an even bigger hurdle to overcome. You know, it was a death penalty case. It was, it was a capital case. Ultimately, the jury decided they wouldn't have him executed. He was sentenced to two life sentences plus five years for the weapons charge. Michael Chappell would now likely spend the rest of his life in prison. And that's where he's been for the past 29 years. 
But that's not necessarily the end of his story. He says, I stood in open court and said, no, I didn't do it. And then was found guilty, so that therefore makes me a convicted liar. So I told everybody up to him, including everybody today, don't believe anything I say. My jury and my peers said I'm a convicted liar. Check for yourself. You decide. In the Land of Lies is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and reported by me, Sean Kipe, and I wrote and performed the original music score. Story editor is Jason Hoke, and executive producers are Jason Hoke and Gino Falsetto. Cover art and design by Gina Sullivan. Sound engineering by Shane Freeman. Creative producer is Henry Ball, and you can find Henry's book, Michael Chapel, at storiedpress.store. For updates about this and all of my podcasts, follow me on social media at Sean Kipe. If you like the show, tell your friends and leave a review. And as always, thanks for listening.